morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to episode eight of the ESG show, a weekly show we broadcast uh, every Wednesday, um, targeted partly at people who work in ESG, partly at people who are interested in ESG, and also with a long-term objective of flying the ESG flag and of evangelizing ESG to a wider community. And today we're doing something a little different. Um, yesterday, I was at the Reset Connect conference slash exhibition, um, which was at the Excel Centre in London, focused on sustainability. Um, and I interviewed a number of ESG advocates and vendors. And we will finish today's show with a short video from that. But today I'm joined by two guests. Neither are strangers to the show, but she, when she was on last time, Kerry Sheehan, had an internet connection problem, and Rob Cheesewright was co-hosting with me. I wanted to know more about what they had to say. Kerry is talking about ESG and AI disruption and the innovation opportunity. Rob is discussing what went wrong with carbon offset markets and what will happen next. Hello, Kerry. How are you today? I'm good. I'm, I'm good, thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me. It's, it's mine and our pleasure. Kerry Sheehan is a specialist in service design, development, implementation and innovation currently supporting the UK civil service. Kerry is also an award-winning and chartered public relations practitioner. Kerry, strategic advisor to the Alan Turing Institute, is working with the British Standards Institute on the development of global standards for artificial intelligence. Kerry's experience spans the UK Prime Minister's Office, Cabinet Office, Home Office, the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, Health, Tech, B2C and B2B sectors, including global brands such as Microsoft and Intercontinental. Kerry is a qualified machine learning developer and in AI for business provides counsel to executive management teams on the adoption of new technologies and artificial intelligence. This includes the implications of AI, including ethics, opportunities, operations, citizens, and customers, as well as culture change and people upskilling. Kerry also advises and trains on what is required from leadership in the new and emerging eras, including AI standards and AI regulation, how AI can circumnavigate, circumvent some of the challenges with ESG data and, reporter, and reporting. Kerry is an advisor to the Alan Turing Institute. Um, Kerry, so is the um is the genie out of the bottle are we uh um is arnold schwarzenegger gonna appear naked in our mist from the future trying to, to to kill sarah connor anytime soon or or is that or is that slightly exaggerated uh, yeah no no ai hype please no no more robots no more glowing brains no more hands over the laptop i mean we know um, AI has already got a PR and a marketing problem. I'll probably be stronger than that and say it's a bit of an uphill uphill struggle now. So, no, that's not going to happen anytime soon, but only if people are aware and upskilled. Well, that's good news, and especially good news if your name's Sarah, Sarah Connor. Um, Rod Cheeswright is an environmentalist and experienced media commentator. In 2021, Rob joined the Climate Change climate tech startup Pinwheel, where he is chief impact officer. He led the development of Pinwheel's proprietary environmental project impact rating tools. Previous to Pinwheel, Rob was policy and communications director of Britain's most ambitious net zero behavior change campaign, Smart Energy GP and policy advisor within the UK government, primarily working on climate change policy. Hello, Rob, how are you today? Hi, Michael. I'm good. I, that's so much of a tongue twister that we've given you about me. I'm going to change that if I ever come on again. I'm so sorry. It's now, good to see Rob, you. I mean, if, you, if you're going to send us tongue twisters like that, you might not come on again. Well, I'll have to talk about that. <laughs> no, of course, you'd be welcome to come on again. Um, so, so, Rob, now, uh, my view about climate change is that I'm simultaneously optimistic and pessimistic. Pessimistic because I think we're underestimating the worst case. I think it could be more serious than is generally supposed. But I'm optimistic because it seems to me that renewable energy is developing so fast that unless we're fantastically stupid, we can actually um, defeat climate change. What are your thoughts about that? 
I, I'm completely with you on that. I, I, I sort of veer from this climate dread to sort of climate optimism almost within the same hour. And it, it because of those two sort of big trends you state, I mean, we are probably still on track for around two and a half degrees of warming. The consequences of that would be catastrophic. But as you say, the cost of renewables, batteries, EVs, solar, they've all come down so fast that they're now out competing the fossil fuel alternatives. We're seeing policy change happening in most countries. Almost every country has now got net zero targets. Lots of big companies have got net zero targets. It does feel like we are now starting to bend the curve, kind of borrowing COVID-19 language um, down. And so I think we've got a good chance of avoiding the worst. Um, we've already baked in some pretty awful consequences, but I think um, that balance of optimism and pessimism is probably just realism. Okay, thank you for that. So um, uh, we're at that point in today's show um, when we review um, some news stories. And the first news story today is Climate Change Committee says UK no longer a world leader. Um, Rob, I think you were the one that spotted the story. You know, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a huge story, and sort of sort of one of the biggest stories in the UK today, and obviously has huge global consequences. And the report is damning. Um, just by way of background, for people that aren't UK centric, the, the Climate Change Committee is the UK's advisor to the government on all these things, hugely expert and respected. And every year, they have to legally review the government's progress. And their report is damning. You know, they're only, the government is only on track for nine of 50 key indicators. And there's huge domestic consequences of that, of course. You know, we are massively behind on our plans. The lack of progress on energy efficiency and heat pumps have baked in higher energy costs, exacerbated inflation, made the cost of living crisis we have here worse. But internationally, and certainly on climate grounds, that's even more damning. You know, we the other piece of context here is, at COP26 in Glasgow, there was a quite remarkable achievement, in part heavily led by Alex Sharma and the UK presidency. There was a moment of global leadership that the UK had on climate. We were imperfect, but we were making good domestic progress and had done well there. And we've really squandered that opportunity over the last 18 months through bad domestic policy. You know, one of the big areas of concern from the, the climate change committee is that we are starting to license new oil and gas that goes completely against what was agreed in glasgow and so we are now at risk of being considered hypocrites when we ask the global south to stop exploring oil and gas they can quite rightly say to us but you're doing it and you are historically one of the global emitters have benefited hugely from fossil fuels why shouldn't we have our turn so we've We've undermined ourselves globally, which undermines global net zero and risks a warmer, more awful future for all of us. But also with the Inflation Reduction Act and the EU investment, we're falling behind the investment battle. So it's going to cost us growth. It's going to cost us jobs. Essentially, whether you think from a UK perspective or a global perspective, the report shows that we've all been let down in the last 18 months since Glasgow. OK, thank you for that, Rob. Um, so, Kerry, another story that caught my attention is one on the chief investment officer. Uh, and the story says that um, essentially it's saying that ESG is going out of fashion and AI is coming into fashion. Um, it cites some research which says that uh, during earnings calls, uh, following powerful backlash from Republican politicians, mention of companies' environmental, social, and governance profits has dwindled. Um, drawn from scanned transcripts of the earning calls of S&P 500 cor corporations, conducted from March the 15th to June the 9th, ESG mentions peaked in 2021's fourth quarter at 156, and dwindled through four of the past five quarters. Uh, the S&P 500 companies in earnings calls going back to 2010 AI mentions hit a record in Q1 2023, totaling 110. The previous record was 78. So is AI in an ESG out, Kerry? Yeah, I think, well, this just shows, I think if we take it a step back, that this is always going to be a balancing act. So this is just, you know, business as usual horizon scanning, and it's always good to keep an eye on you know what the investment callings are because um, that can obviously set some direction in the market 
Um, so is AI in, um, of, of course it is, and obviously as someone that's working with the British Standards Institute to develop those global AI standards, which will ultimately form the backbone of regulation in, in the UK, the EU, and in other countries um, across the world. Of course, I am going to say that. Um, but there is evidence, that, you know, just sort of doing a bit more digging on that news piece, um, you know, when you look at some of the, you know, standards and pause 500 index, um, for example, as you've quite rightly put out, I think what we're seeing is, you know, AI has been the staple of many tech companies for um, many years. Now there's been an acceleration, you know, through COVID, and now we're seeing that accelerate, you know, faster than we've ever seen before. So AI is in, but is it in, is it in favour or isn't it um, against ESG? I think what we're also seeing is ESG is facing a bit of a political backlash. Um, you know, we are seeing some of the ESG principles come under fire in certain circles. This just obviously picks up on what Rob has just, you know, highlighted here today. It's 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 a hot topic, um, and we've even seen some companies out there, you know, have found that they're you know pro proclaiming dedication to climate control has actually been a liability and a risk for them. But I think we we're all quite clear. We absolutely have to all agree on the principles of ESG and their best intentions. But I think the interesting thing, just um, really quickly before um, we move on, is obviously we're starting to see this thing called green hushing. So obviously companies have to report on their ESG. They may mention it in the annual report, but they may get follow-up calls from the from the media. You know, maybe people like Rob putting them under quite right, quite rightly so scrutiny and and so forth. And more and more seem to be deciding not to actually respond. So I think there's an issue to, to look out there. And obviously the Corporate Governance Institute has highlighted that not so long ago um, on strategies. But whereas on the other side, we've obviously that, that piece and you know stock markets show that investments in AI has continued. So far, AI hasn't really upset anyone. We've got a lot of hype around AI, of course, which you quite rightly highlighted at the start. And even though we have to be mindful you know, of the potential societal impacts for AI, you know, widening the gap, possible, you know, mass job losses or job changes and so forth. I think what we should be thinking is actually on the flip side, AI can really support um, ESG um, as, as, as we move forwards. So I think, yes, it's not it's not either or, it, it's both, but just to be aware of the landscape that, that we're in. Okay, because I'm another thought that there are social implications of AI. You know, they're, they're, they're far reaching and you need ESG just to, to help tackle that, don't you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Part of your business as usual, you know, risk, 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 risk management and, and so forth. So, you know, I think even overnight we've seen stories on the news. Um, a water company, I obviously won't name which, which one it is, um, said that our household water bills may go up by 40% by 2030 to support stop the sewage pumping into the sea to obviously you know restore the pipes and so forth so that that kind of just shows you there the balancing act that we've got but for example ai can actually help mitigate against having to replace the whole lot of pipes because you know it just sets alert systems up and and so forth so again i think it does come back to it's not either or they both support each other and i think they absolutely have to be collaborative partners and we'll see more of that as we move forward as companies fathom out you know their approaches to, to AI and where it can really support them. Okay interesting in fact uh, incidentally I, I saw a story yesterday that one of the largest uh, water utility companies in the UK could be on the verge of collapse precisely for the reasons yeah. that we just discussed. Yeah, that, that's, that's where that that's come from. Yeah. yeah indeed okay so um so Rob last summer I was on holiday and I was having a lovely meal with octopus. I was eating some octopus. And, and just after my meal, my, no, my, my phone, phone beeped. And it was a new news flash. Octopuses are one of the most intelligent creatures in the world and they're sentient. And I felt very guilty. I felt very guilty about this octopus that I'd eaten. And I vowed at that point, I don't think I'm going to eat octopus anymore, which is a shame because I really like octopus. I, I've got a feeling calamari is quite intelligent, so squid's quite intelligent as well. So that's really frustrating. But anyway, um, there's a story around at the moment in The Guardian um, about the new world of octopus farming. 
Plans for the world's first commercial octopus farm are well advanced, just as science discovers more about this curious, intelligent, and affectionate animal. Can it be done ethically? Do you have any thoughts about that one, Rob? Yeah, so this is a story that's been running for a, a few weeks now, and, and environmental campaigners and scientists have been trying to raise the alarm of just how horrifying this is. And I suppose, um, you know, the story is as you set it out, the big, the big thing is, you know, if someone said, you know, that thing where every time there's an expose on pig farming or, or beef or whatever else, and it shows horrible conditions and horrible abuse of these animals, huge climate impacts, waste impacts that lead to some of the degradation of our waters. I know, I've got a good idea. Let's now extend that to another highly intelligent species. I mean, I'm just sort of tearing my hair out of the concept of it, to be honest. You know, as you say, highly complex, intelligent, sentient animals. And, and you know, we, we eat lots of other sentient animals. You know, pigs are, are highly intelligent, complex sentient animals. So that necessarily needn't be the bar, although I should flag I am vegetarian, so I wouldn't touch any of it. Um, but but the, it extends this clearly a bad business model into another area and huge issues with behavior they're largely solitary animals so they're not well designed to factory conditions the waste runoff straight into the ocean could have potential other ecosystem disbenefits there's another really interesting big picture here is that we're about to enter the era of synthetic meat and so you know if there's kind of been big revolutions of humanity one was from hunter gathering to industrial farming you know we went into that you know we changed the entire way we live as humans we're about to enter another one we're about to go from the farming era into the, the kind of synthetic meat era and of course that probably decades away before it scales so not only is it kind of ethically doesn't feel very good but it also feels like investing in a nokia 3310 as we're about to enter the iphone era it just sort of feels like <laughs> every count <laughs> yeah i agree with you um excuse me I agree with you about um, about about synthetic meat culture meat. I, I I think it's going to be hugely disruptive. Probably not this decade. Maybe not next decade. Or if it is next decade, it will be towards the end of it. But massive massive change in the offing. I think. Okay. Well, thank you for that, um, guys. I hope you don't mind me calling you a guy, Kerry. Um, before we move on to next week's ESG show, I want to just, uh, sorry, before we move on, I want to very quickly tell you about next week's ESG show, where the theme is ESG and agility. Uh, and the big question is, is ESG a circus without a master? Uh, so, so I'll be joined by some great guests next week, perhaps some of the leading experts in the world on agility. Uh, so for more on that, see you next week, 1 p.m. British summertime, uh, Wednesday the 5th of July. Now, I'm going to be having a chat with Rob for a few minutes at this point. Um, and Rob's going to talk about the carbon offset markets and what will happen next. So um, tell me about recent exposés that have shaken the carbon offset market. What, what's gone wrong, Rob? Yeah, so, we, you know, this this has been something that's been rumbling along for a long time now. And, uh, and you know, there was this general uh, theory of change for co corporates is account for your carbon and disclose it, reduce what you can, and you may need to offset the rest. And because a tonne of carbon emitted in one place and a tonne of carbon emitted, uh, you know, avoided elsewhere, can be roughly the same in the atmosphere, there is a potential role for carbon offset. That was the theory. In reality, that's just not deliverable because these projects, except for potentially a subset of some long-term carbon removal projects, cannot ever promise to deliver a ton of carbon removed or avoided forever. And the idea of a binary absolute claim like carbon neutral or net zero, which is what these offsets are, are designed for, um, ever being true and not greenwash has become really unpicked. And on top of that, you've seen some kind of poorish practice in the market. And so that's where the big exposés have come in because you've seen The Guardian look at a, a large number of Red Plus projects. So these are the forest protection projects and found that the modeling that underpins them hasn't really worked out. I said, lots of those forests were never at risk of being felled. So the carbon credits that were created for them were probably worthless. And of course, what those credits have enabled is a company to be neutral and therefore potentially emit elsewhere. So it could be harmful for the planet 
that these credits were ever sold. And then similarly, Bloomberg and others have looked at large scale renewable carbon offsets, so wind turbines and hydropower in particular, and, and lots of others have looked and found that essentially because of the huge capital investment required for those projects, those projects would have gone ahead anyway. The idea of selling off tranches of carbon offsets over the next 10, 15 years of its lifetime as having been a crucial part of that project has been pretty debunked, which means that about 70% or there or thereabouts of the carbon offset market is pretty hard to buy. You can never know that it's actually done any good. And you certainly can't trust that it's, that it's delivered a carbon neutral claim for you. So huge, huge, huge risk for brands now that are saying that they are carbon neutral or net zero as a result of offsets. And then obviously a huge loss of confidence in the market. And we've seen what should grow to a kind of $500 billion market continuing to bubble along the bottom at around $2 billion peak. It's probably dropped back in 2022 from its peak in 2021. So the market's really lost momentum. Okay, so what are the implications of this? I mean, in terms of getting to net zero, restoring the ecosystem. So uh, could there be a risk of cor you know, corporate loss of faith in the whole area? I mean, I'm thinking of um, Bjork here. Do you remember Bjork? She did that song, uh, uh, So Quiet. Do you remember that song? Shh. Yeah. Green Hush. You know, not shh, but Green Hush. Is it, could the pendulum, pendulum swing to Green Hush, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think this is the big, big problem that people, you know, in my space, as you know, so I work in a company that funds planet repairing projects that really worry about is that if that that industry doesn't get to grow to sort of $500 billion or more then the three or $4 trillion we need of climate finance before you even get to biodiversity finance just never emerges. And brands are, um, some brands are you know, seeing that this market hasn't worked and have seen that they were accused of greenwash or their peers were and have gone, well, let's let's hold back. Let's do nothing. And that inertia is just so dangerous. And, you know, there is a real, um, I think this is the biggest risk, obviously, to individual brands. There's brand risk for doing the wrong thing. But for us collectively, we need brands to take brave decisions now. We've got 27 years to 2050. We need trillions of dollars of climate finance to emerge starting now. And we need corporates to play their role in that. So we, you know, there's a real challenge if if something doesn't emerge to replace the poor offset projects that our brands don't have confidence in it, that we are end up in a much worse place than we are today. Okay, so so what's next then, do you think? So I think there's there's two big trends that are kind of occurring on top of that. There absolutely has been a short-term loss of confidence and a reduction in the size of the market which you would expect given that you know you can't go more than two days without a story saying how, how some of the poor practices but because brands find it so hard to pull levers to reduce their carbon so much of it is out of their control whether it's you know they're reliant on the electricity grid they're reliant on supply chains i think brands will need to continue to look outside of their value chain for part of their sustainability story and one of the benefits of investing outside of their value chain in things like offsets is that they enable for hero storytelling. Big, beautiful projects, seagrass, keystone species, amazing carbon projects that you can't really get if you reduce your carbon to a 3% a year, because as important as that is, it's the most important thing. You know, if you, you know, you can put it in your annual sustainability report, but if you tell a broad mix of consumers or stakeholders, good news, guys, we've reduced our carbon by 3%, people will sort of shrug and not really understand if that's any good or not. They'd, they'd hope the answer would be zero carbon, not just 3% less. So you need heroes and you need stuff outside of your value chain as a brand. So I think that will that will require the market to grow again. I think the other big, big trend in the market is the rise of the contribution approach. So whereas Offset said, let us compensate for our carbon, you know, no harm done guys, don't worry, we've done some carbon over here, but we've compensated over here, it's equaled out. And the focus there was on making that claim for the brand. There's been a rise of a contribution mindset. And that seeks to answer, answer the question, well, what has the biggest impact rather than what can I say about my brand? And, you know, that's the, that's the approach that Pinwheel, my company, has been promoting for about two years now. And we were pretty alone in that, certainly in the UK. Since then, WWF has been promoting a contribution approach. Gold standard, the, the most trusted carbon crediting body, has just put out its contribution principles. And now even South Pole, one of the biggest offset companies has put out a contribution like framework. 
So we're seeing the whole market shift to a contribution rather than compensation approach. And I think that's really brilliant and vital because that enables a much more honest conversation. You know, rather than don't worry, guys, we're carbon neutral. It says, you know, we are doing some harm here. There is some carbon, but we're restoring the planet. We're, we're, we're investing in carbon projects. We're investing in biodiversity projects. And that claim is inherently true because if you're investing in it, you are. But it enables us also to fund some of the projects that were kind of locked out of the voluntary carbon market, peatland, seagrass, other blue carbon projects. In bio, it enables you to look at biodiversity and waste where there's amazing storytelling potential. And then some of the carbon removal projects that we need to scale up to 2050 as well. So I think there's been a, a, a we're at the start of a new best practice emerging in, in the form of a contribution rather than compensation approach. And I think that will enable money to flow back into that market, or at least gives the chance for money to flow back into that market and scale up the climate finance that we need. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Now, um, I'm gonna to turn to Kerry in a second, but can you just stay with us? And uh, we've got two or three questions have come in. So if we get to, get chance, it'd be quite nice to address those, que those questions in about 10 minutes. So uh, with a bit of luck, I'll be speaking to you again in about 10 minutes, if, depending on how we're doing for time. Um, and now I'm being joined by Kerry again and uh, AI and disruption. Uh, welcome back, Kerry. Um, now, imagine it was the year 2000 and by some miracle, you discover this time capsule from the year 2012. And in the time capsule, it says, in 2012, more photographs will be taken than any year in history, and PC sales will fall. Okay, so aside from being a bit frustrated that you've had a message from the future and it's incredibly cryptic, what would you do? I think an illogical action might have been to say, well, I'm going to buy shares in Kodak and sell Apple, uh, which is um, which would have been a bad idea because in 2012, Kodak went bust and Apple became the largest company in the world. And that's kind of what I think of when I think of disruptive te technology. Um, what And what can you do to risk the ravages of disruption? Uh, blockbusters turned down Netflix because they thought Reed Hastings' plan to drop, um, to drop fines for late returns would cannibalize their product. Uh, RIM Blackberry feared a touchscreen phone could cannibalize their product. There are many, many more examples. And someone once told me, if you want to avoid disruption, cannibalize or be eaten or disrupt or be disrupted. And I believe a lot of the common, a lot of the, um, the climate change backlash denialism is actually a combination of, um, uh, of this kind of fear of disruptive technology. Um, and, I, and I feel that a lot of companies that, that resist climate change, despite the remarkable advantages of renewables, are you know, a bit like Blockbusters or, 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 or RIM or Kodak, um, they're like ostriches, bending their heads in the sand. Um, I, I think that's why there's been so much climate change denial. Anyway, that takes us to the two big disruptive forces at the moment, right now, which are ESG and AI, I think. So, Carrie, is AI really... Uh, the new ESG? So I would say AI isn't the new ESG. AI is not going to go away. It's only going to accelerate. But I think just to reassure people, I mean, AI um, has been around for many, many decades. It's just the fact that we've never had as much data as we have now to make it actually viable. So if you go back to, you know, Alan Turing and you know, trying to fathom out some mass equations and so forth, and it even goes back to, a, you know, a lot longer before that. So, um, again, I think we'll only see that um, accelerate and kind of reshape what, what we're doing. But I think, you know, your nod to disruption, innovation, is not always a comfortable place for people. You know, just going slightly off topic, but I will put it back. I mean, humans, it's the fear of the unknown, which means many people don't like change. But change is now the only one constant in this life. So I think we all have to be at the edge of disruption and innovation, become more resilient to it and just see how they um, all uh, interlink. So the only thing that's not changing is the thing is the fact that things are changing. Yeah. Um, 
works. Yes, so we're, we're in a technological revolution. We've been we've been here before when we went from sort of hand tools, stones. I think the Flintstones to the Industrial Revolution, where you know the all the um, big you know iron and mining companies um, were, were going for it. You know we've had computers. I remember Pac-Man and, and and things like that. So look how far we've come. We've even got you know AI generators now and. You know, I can verify that I do exist, but actually there are people that don't exist that look very, very real. So look where we are today. Well, I'm fairly confident that I exist as well. I have a reasonably <laughs> confident, high confidence level in that one. So uh, that makes two of us. <laughs> so it's been said that without, a, uh, without AI, we won't meet ESG goals and address climate change. So can you tell me a little bit, a little bit about this? Yeah, I think this is um, really important because ultimately AI can crunch millions of different data points faster, smarter, faster than any human or a group of humans could ever be able um, to do. Um, and that can ultimately free us up for more time to look at what the data is telling us because it's humans that imbue the meaning into the data at the end of the day. So what are our next steps? What is our approach, response, tactics, strategical direction? Um, to, to ESG. So ultimately, you know, by running algorithms, you know, looking at data platforms, whatever the setup may be, you know, you can actually reduce harm to the environment. Um, and that's already happening, you know, from looking at the possibility of wildfires to farm floods and, and, and so forth. So it can drive efficiencies, you know, uh, preserve biodiversity. We've just heard Rob, you know, talk about and some of the other things on the animal side of things, and you know, even octopuses and, and, and so forth, and really reduce waste. So you know, even like local small councils are using AI to look at, you know, when is the optimal time to tell people to put the bins out, uh, because that links into how much could go to landfill and behaviour change and so forth. So it's really quite interesting. There's always a bigger picture to this, as you can see. Um, but also, you know, AI fits in well because you know you can examine. Um, how um, ESG and AI is really supporting to enhance and improve people's lives, whether that's improving interactions, you know, between companies, people, businesses, or just, you know, helping us to live our lives kind of smarter, not always keen on the faster, but, you know, a lot smarter and more, more efficient. Okay, so thanks for that. So, um, so we can say, um, you know, E is for environmental, S is for social, <clears throat> is AI being used? Um, how? Where is AI being used to to report on ESG performance? So, if you look at um, you know environmental, you know we were speaking about water collection things earlier. It's being used to map the ocean's footprint. You know the rise in the ocean levels, um, which is a real risk to us. It's being used in some countries to predict rainfall to support farmers, particularly in some of the, you know, the Africa and the, the, the Asian companies um, and, and so forth, you know, right down to, you know, when is the best time to supply, you know, the materials and the services and, and, and so forth. Um, it's particularly being used in the farming worlds, which is quite interesting to see, something known as agritech, so agricultural tech, um, particularly if you look to countries like Africa, I mean, obviously the more advanced countries like the UK and Europe, have already been using technology in farming for quite a while. And they're now looking to AI to improve agricultural processes, ways of doing things, food stability to the nation, very important. Obviously that supports um, economics um, and economic growth and livelihood. It supports the rural communities, which we absolutely must all do. But if you look towards some of the African nations, um, digitization transformation is absolutely key to their success. They are fully part of this fourth industrial revolution and they are accelerating and upping the game, so to say. But even some of the rural communities are still not connected to the internet. So you've actually got, you know, AI and data companies trying to support um, agriculture um, without being connected, which is a really interesting thing to see. So when is the optimal time to plant crops? When is the optimal time to not plant crops? Because we're due a big monsoon next week, which is two months earlier than we anticipated because we know we've got climate change and environmental impacts. So again, really interesting to see. Uh, and ultimately that supports livelihoods. So that's great. Okay. Thanks for that, Carrie. So we've got quite a few questions coming in. So perhaps we could try and answer the next few questions quite quickly because we are getting pushed for time. Mm -hmm. But I have got a few questions for you. 
And what about generative AI? Chat GPT is an example of generative AI, I believe. Can you just explain what generative AI is and what's that got to do with ESG? So generative AI, is, well, Chat GPT um, launched a market, caught a lot of businesses on the, on the back foot, and they're now playing catch up on what their policies approaches are. But ultimately, large language models um, that are predictive. Um, ChatGPT, all it does is it scrapes everything and anything from the internet from about 2020, 2021. So do be careful what you're reading because it might not be the most completely um, up to date. But I think we'll, where we'll see generative um, you know, AI and ESG will really start to shape things, particularly for ESG reporting, telling the narrative, getting stakeholders on side, taking people on the journey with you is that whole big data um, and analytics side. And I, I do think we'll see the software market combining both of those will start to grow um, in, in the next year. So I think someone's um, possibly asking a question um, about this so we can explore this um, a bit more. But it allows you to collect more data points than you've ever been able to collect before. So that enables you to be um, a bit more strategic. You can look um, in more detail um, more thoroughly and again more strategically about the risks and opportunities um, that, that you've got from the data that you're collecting and ultimately tell tell your story better. Okay thank you for that. So, for, so, so just two more quick questions. Um, um, so ESG concerns are growing as artificial intelligence becomes more popular. So what do investors need to know? So if you're an investor in AI, I mean, we were talking earlier about, you know, Standards & Poor's top 500, the tech companies in the US, and we seem to have seen, witnessed a bit of an explosion on AI investment, particularly over the, the past months. And as, as again, like what we said so far, hasn't um, witnessed any major political um, storm. So, so far, um, so good. Um, I think if you're investing in AI or you're an investment company, you've got to be mindful of potential societal impacts of AI, whether you're using AI for ESG purposes or it's helping you with another purpose which links to your, you know, your ESG drive or your reporting and so forth. Because particularly we know AI has the potential to cause impacts to society. There's a lot of commentary out there. How do we ensure we not only upskill people, but we bring people along with AI developments. Um, and the gap between the have and the have nots doesn't get bigger. We know that women may be inadvertently impacted, for example, women returners to the market and, and so forth. So absolutely invest in it. It's not going to go anywhere, but just make sure that what you're going to be using it for is right. But also the other side of this is your own ESG. Make sure that the AI is ethically developed, ethically built, ethical data, AI produces a lot of carbon output. So just be mindful of that. Where, where's your where's your trade-off? Where's your comfortable trade-off there? Okay, Kerry, I'm sorry to do this to you. I've got a question for you that will probably take an hour to answer, and I'm giving you 30 seconds. Okay, Perfect. so you've got 30 seconds to condense an hour, worth, or probably maybe even a month's worth of research, and that is what about ESG in terms of governance and pending AI regulation in the UK, EU, US and across the world? 30 seconds. So 30 <laughs> seconds. Um, you can always contact me afterwards if, if, if you need more info. But um, EU AI Act due to come in 2025, if not sooner, may be expedited. Um, AI standards, keep an eye on those. They will ultimately form the backbone of regulation. But see how they dock into your ESG strategies. So the boardroom, the exec team should be having those discussions already. You know, where where is your where are your risk points? You know, what are you doing to tip the balance? Dock technology in, that's great. What are the regulations? We need to be mindful of that. We need to follow them, but don't tip the balance so you're causing ultimately harm to people, society, and others when you shouldn't be. Thank you for that, Kerry. I, I would actually like to talk to you more about regulation, so maybe we can have a, another yeah. chat about yeah, that. Thank you very much. Don't go away. Uh, we've got a couple of questions, and uh, one of the questions is a bit of a, it's, it's a bit of a spin on it, really, because it applies to both Rob and Kerry. Um, uh, Bobby White, the most variable model I have seen on the market is with a startup that I recently joined, uh, www.climatevault.org founded by Michael Greenstone, who developed the social cost of carbon. Taking contributions to purchase allowance from compliance markets, then converting those allowances into permanent carbon removal. 
curious if anyone has seen a similar model out there. And so I, I'm starting to, I think, is the is the answer. And that that is a, roughly the approach that Pinwheel uh, we promote in terms of our white paper. And also we've looked at how do you price carbon? So the big one of the big problems with the voluntary carbon market is that you know a, a price of five dollars per ton is woefully low. As, as Bobby's question shows, I mean the social cost of carbon has been estimated at about two hundred and fifty pounds in the UK. Germany and the US a, a bit lower, near $150, $200 or euros, depending on what you're looking at. Obviously, that's a huge gap. So, um, yes, I mean, certainly Pinwheel is one of them. We recommend setting an internal carbon fee of more like £100 um, and then using that to invest in a broad range of projects, particularly carbon removal, as Bobby says, as being a crucial one. Um, but that's it's really aligned to the WWF blueprint, which I think is the kind of keystone text for best practice here, which is, you know, know your emissions by the back of your hand, reduce what you can, but set that internal carbon fee high enough so you can invest in great projects and then use a contribution approach to invest in the highest impact ones. You will, you will land on uh, carbon removal as one of those options, as, as, as Bobby's question says. So, yeah, there's certainly a few of us out there now. Um, you know, we started two years ago with that exact broad philosophy and there's lots. It, it's emerging as a new best practice, I think. Okay, thank you, Rob. And then Bobby also asks, um, um, as more, well, it's more of a statement, really, but I, I'd like you to say yes or no, really, carry to this one. As more emissions data becomes public, we will see AI solutions developed for the purpose of carbon calculation. Yep. Yes or no? Yep. yep. So there's, already, there's already quite a few on the market. I mean, obviously, what Rob, Rob does bears testament to that, but absolutely, yeah, it'll only grow. Okay. Then Nelish Gupta wants to know, how do you calculate the emissions from AI? So this, this is, um, yeah, something that's kind of in controversy at, at, at the moment. And Rob will probably be able to talk through more of the technicalities of actually how you do, do measure it. But I think it's just to always be mindful that the machine, so to say, the servers, the, the data warehouses, you know, even, you know, putting data up in the in the cloud, the data lakes, you are going to increase, you know, your carbon footprint. There is work being done in certain cohorts on how to reduce that. Could we could we even get to a point in the future where it is carbon neutral? I'm sure there are people working on it and perhaps that's something that we can go and find out. And, you know, with, you know, ESG and, and climate um, action colleagues, Perhaps we could come back here and have a discussion because I think that's quite interesting. Well, I think that would be great because we are kind of out of time now. And I just want to say Nanish Gupta also wants to know how AI will help in better, more accurate scope three. Well, that's not a question we can answer in 30 seconds, that's for sure. But I would like to return to that question, maybe with the two of you. Uh, Leanne Hickman says AI is complementary to ESG. AI can help process a tremendous amount of data available and help with decision mm -hmm. intelligence. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, Leanne. Um, thank you very much for your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Rob and Kerry. And I hope we'll see you both on the shoot show soon. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Um, I'm going to sign out in a minute and hand you over to a, a clip from yesterday's conference that I attended, um, uh, which is the Reset Connect exhibition in London, focusing on sustainability. Um, we hope our... Uh, uh, this is live, this is recording, so apologies in advance if there are any technical problems. Please join us next week, 1pm, British summertime, BST, to talk about ESG and agility. And ESG is a circus without a ring, Oscar. I'll say goodbye now um, and see you again next week. And if all goes to plan, any second, you will be seeing a, a video which will end the show. My name is Kelly Lloyd and I work here at AXA Climate with the AXA Climate School. Well, just like 30 years ago when you had the digital transformation, not everyone needed to know about um, how to code in C, what a mainframe is, but everyone needed to know how to use a computer. Nowadays, the next transition that we're doing is the green transition or the sustainable transition or net zero transition, whatever you want to call it. But the key thing is that every single person needs to have a basis understanding of sustainability for you to be able to do this transition.
Well, once again, just like the digital transformation, everyone didn't even know how to use a computer. And when it comes to a company specifically, there are gonna be decisions that are gonna be made that unless you understand about sustainability, the kind of, what you're doing doesn't make sense. A great example would be if you work in HR and you've got two people that you're recruiting for for the head of procurement, one has 15 years experience, the other has 10 years experience, but the one had 10 years experience in their last position had uh, scope three emissions as one of their targets. Anyone who's done sustainability training understands that that would be the much better candidate for the job, even though the other person might have an extra five years. And this is a perfect example of someone in HR and why they need to be trained as well. And this comes down to risk. It also comes down to sales. It comes down to all parts of a company. And the first, the first part to it is there is no silver bullet. When it comes down to it, there's not one company that's able to do all your training. So the first thing you need to do is divide your company up into audiences. So for example, the audience of everyone understanding sustainability, then your audience of specific people within certain job functions, and then those that might need, for example, a whole new course to change a whole different range. But once you've done this kind of breaking it down into audiences, is now thinking about for your company of your size in your location, what type of training would be most effective to that group and start there. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Martin. I am the ESG manager at Algebra. Algebra is a fintech similar to something like the Revolut, um, but we have a explicit focus on the social and environment aspects. So we focus a lot on financial inclusion, financial well-being and sustainability. We think this is really important because money makes the world go round. The way that you spend, save and invest today really determines the society that we will all live in tomorrow. And we're looking to bridge the gap between the S and the E that is often overlooked in the ESG element. One, because those communities are often the most overlooked. And secondly, they also need sustainable finance the most. So I think one reason why it's really important to bridge this gap is if you're looking at who's kind of emitted the most greenhouse gas emissions, you'll see that it's a lot of the developing economies. And now who's paying the brunt of it are developing economies. And what we need to do is establish a world in which these developing economies can still develop, because obviously there's a lot of social criteria, such as inequality, education, healthcare, and so on, that need to be developed in those areas. But those need to be done in a way that doesn't um, have a negative impact on the planet as we do so. So it's very important to find a solution that is both sustainable and equitable. And this is often referred to as a just transition or sustainable development. And that's what we're looking to do is play that role in that space as a fintech, which I think is quite a, a unique position. Yeah, hi everyone. My name's Rich Campbell and I work for Geeky. Geeky is a sustainability engagement uh, web app and phone app. And we help people learn what they can do to live more sustainably, learn what they can do for the planet, and calculate their carbon footprint. We're here today at Reset Connect to talk to as many people as possible about how they can use Geeky to engage their employees on sustainability. It's a really exciting emerging strand of sustainability strategy, and we're seeing the likes of Deloitte, Accenture, Compass, and NatWest at the vanguard of this really exciting movement where people recognize the importance of engaging uh, individuals and citizens and their employees and help them become more engaged with the climate crisis and what they can do as personal individual citizens. Once they've done that, they know what they can do for the planet and are able to bring that innovative thinking, that kind of engagement with what they can do, and bring that back into the workplace, which can then help connect with the organization's sustainability strategy, or they can uh, then take that thinking into how they work better with their clients or what they can do better as a business to work better for the planet. Engaging your employees is a really, really important new uh, piece of the sustainability puzzle. Um, and if you're part of the Race to Zero or it's part of your climate commitments, then it's a really cool way to be able to evidence that as well as provide a really nice way to engage with your employees. So it's really important for them and for you. Um, if you've got any questions, I'd love to connect with as many of you on LinkedIn as possible. It's Richard Campbell. Hi, my name is Sandeep Sali. I am the founder and managing director at uh, Ampergia Limited. My company is into providing the net zero solutions to the businesses. That includes the installation of the energy, uh, renewable energy products and integrating that into the technology platform so that the customer can have 
a single view, single sign of information about the green generations and the carbon they are reducing. Uh, my advice to the businesses is, you know, looking at the current scenario and the climate change, it's very important that you look at your carbon footprint and try to be sustainable by adopting to the greener technologies wherever possible. Every business has potential to reduce the carbon footprint. It starts with how do you commute, how do you work, when do you work, what do you do uh, at work, and you know, just as simple as you know, switching off your lights on time, and also looking at the partners like Ampergia, who can actually look at the way you consume your energy and what you can do to reduce that uh, in an optimal way. I think that's that's basically my advice that you know, everybody has a contribution to make and when everybody works together, I think we as a country can meet our net zero target. Thank you.